Simon Peter leaves Jerusalem. So I was going to comment on this video uh, on church history. Okay. All right, so I'm going to comment on this video uh, on the YouTube channel Church History. I'm going to use it as commentary uh, according to the fair use policy. And uh, what I want to go into is once they say something that contradicts, then I'm going to stop the video and then give my own take on it, uh, given the scripture. All right, let's get started. Thirty three AD, forty days after his resurrection, Jesus Christ ascends into heaven. He leaves behind eleven apostles, commissioning them to make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. There were only 500 disciples in the world, all of them located in the remote Roman province of Judea. This is the story of how the Gospel spread from 500 disciples in Jerusalem to the whole world. Nine days after the Ascension, the day of Pentecost, the twelve apostles are praying together with uh, Do you notice this image? Uh, they put Mary at the center of it and the Holy Spirit on top of her. This never happened, obviously. The apostles did not sit around Mary and, and pray this way. They waited on the Holy Spirit and she did not have her hands out like that and a halo around her head. As it, as if she's something special. I mean, she's special. She's blessed among women, but how on this halo around her? She's not God. They, she should have fire on top of her head as well, just like the other guys. Let's carry on. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit descends upon them, and Peter preaches to the people of Jerusalem. Three thousand people are converted the church is born. People from all across the known world are present in Jerusalem to hear Peter's speech. In Acts 8, Philip, while in Gaza, shares the gospel with the eunuch of the royal court of Ethiopia. The eunuch believes the gospel and is baptized. He returns to Ethiopia to spread the good news. Philip continues his preaching in Caesarea Maritima on the Mediterranean coast. In Acts 11, persecuted disciples in Jerusalem flee as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, where they spread the gospel. Antioch is the third largest city in the Roman Empire after Rome and Alexandria. In Acts 13 and 14, Paul and Barnabas spread the gospel in Cyprus, Pamphylia. Hold on, I wanted to go back on this a little bit. Mm. In Acts 11, persecuted disciples in Jerusalem flee as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, where they spread the gospel. Antioch is the third largest city in the Roman Empire after Rome and Alexandria. <clears throat> but in God's eyes, uh, Jerusalem was the center pretty much, even though they were being persecuted there. There were still some believers uh, that remained. In Acts 13 and 14, Paul and Barnabas spread the gospel in Cyprus, Pamphylia, and southern Galatia. Well, we know that Paul first spread to the Gentiles, and then Peter eventually got the revelation 
uh, in Acts 10 that uh, the Gentiles were also unclean. But before that, uh, Paul had to rebuke him uh, for treating Gentiles as if they were filthy and different in Christ, when we're all the same in Christ Jesus. Following the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, Paul sets out on his second missionary journey from Antioch, preaching the gospel in his native Cilicia before moving on to Macedonia and Greece. On his return home, he visits Ephesus, the largest city in the Roman province of Asia in modern-day Turkey, and the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. In Acts 18-21, Paul sets out from Antioch to visit the churches he had established across Galatia, Asia, Macedonia and Greece before returning to Jerusalem. In Acts 27, Paul is taken under guard by Roman soldiers from Judea to Rome. After leaving Crete, the ship is lost to a storm, but miraculously lands at Malta in Acts 28, from where Paul makes his final journey to Rome. The narrative history of the Bible ends in Acts 28 with Paul teaching the faith in Rome. Tradition tells us of the journeys of the other apostles. St. James, the older brother of John the Evangelist, preaches the gospel in Spain. He returns to Jerusalem where, in Acts 12, he is run through with the sword by Herod Agrippa. Philip spreads the gospel in Asia where he is crucified upside down. Bartholomew travels to India. After sharing the gospel there, he travels to the kingdom of Armenia, the location of Mount Ararat where he is skinned alive and beheaded. Thomas, who doubted the resurrection of Jesus, preaches in the kingdoms of Osirene and Armenia before traveling to India, where he preaches in Punjab and Mylapur. He is stabbed to death by Hindu priests near Madras. Matthew stays in Palestine, where he writes his gospel in Hebrew. He eventually moves to Ethiopia, where he is martyred. Simon and Jude preach in Tessaphon, capital of the Parthian Empire, where they are said to convert 60,000 believers before returning to Suenair, modern-day Beirut in Syria, where they are martyred. Matthias, who was chosen to replace the Apostle Judas, evangelizes Armenia and the north shore of the Black Sea. He returns to Jerusalem and is stoned to death. Saint James the Just stays in Jerusalem and prays in the temple every day. Finally, an angry mob throws him off the top of the temple and stones and clubs him to death. Shortly thereafter, Jerusalem revolts against the Roman Empire. The armies of Vespasian march on Jerusalem and completely destroy it, including the temple, in 70 AD. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, spreads the gospel as far north as Crimea and present-day Ukraine, before preaching in Byzantium, present-day Constantinople, and finally arriving at the city of Patras, in the province of Achaia, present-day Greece, where he is crucified on an X-shaped cross as he deemed himself unworthy to be crucified on the same type of cross as Jesus. Simon Peter leaves Jerusalem following the council in Acts 15 and becomes the first bishop of Antioch, where he stays for eight years. He then preaches... Yeah, I don't think he's, he was the first bishop of Antioch. I think Paul had gone through there and obviously um had set bishops and he set the the the, 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 the way that one became a bishop uh, one one is blameless uh, husband of one wife able to lead not apt to teach not a not a drinker of uh, not a drunkard so i think this idea that peter is the first uh, Bishop of Antioch is false. Let's carry on. ...in Asia before arriving in Rome. Simon Magus, who in Acts 8 had attempted to buy the gift of laying on hands, follows Peter in his travels across the world, performing magic tricks to convince people that he, not Jesus, is the true saviour. Simon Magus teaches his followers that he is the true God who had revealed himself as the Father in Samaria, the Son in Judea, and now the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles. Simon Magus becomes known as the father of all heretics, those who try to lead the faithful astray from the sound teaching of Simon Peter. Simon Magus also taught that his followers were... 
the sound teaching of Simon Peter as if Paul wasn't teaching sound teaching uh, this is pretty uh, I mean putting Peter as the pillar of truth uh, no nah, he's not the pillar of truth is Jesus Christ Paul was just a follower of Christ or Peter and Paul be saved by grace alone without the need for good works because in his teaching the designation of works as good or bad was an arbitrary construct invented by fallen angels. At Rome Simon Peter and Simon Magus are brought before Emperor Nero. While the Apostle Paul prays for Simon Peter, Simon Magus performs a magic trick where he is lifted into the air by demons. However, Simon Peter commands the demons to release him and Simon Magus falls to his death. Yeah, I think this is kind of an exaggeration, to be honest. Simon Peter sends his disciple, Mark the Evangelist, to Alexandria, Egypt, the second largest city in the world. Mark becomes Alexandria's first bishop. Emperor Nero blames Christians for the Great Fire of Rome in the year 64 and slaughters the Christians in Rome. The apostles Peter and Paul are martyred. Peter is crucified upside down on Vatican Hill because he deems himself unworthy to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus. Yeah, I think that that's that's accurate. Saint John the Evangelist is thrown into a cauldron of boiling oil in Rome, but is unharmed. He is then banished to the island of Patmos, where he receives the vision of Revelation. After he is released from exile, yeah, and in the vision of Revelation, he talks about the different churches uh, in Asia Minor, and he specifically mentions them as different churches. And they were not all right with God, so it wasn't just like one body, but multiple bodies that made up one. Uh, yeah. Saint John resides in Ephesus. His the notice it doesn't speak about a pope in Rome or any of that, so uh, because that came much later, and uh, that wasn't the original teaching of the apostles. His last words are said to be, "Little children, love one another." The Apostles established churches throughout the Mediterranean world, led by the three Petrine Seas of Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch. Notice you said Petrine Seas, but there was no such idea of Petrine Seas at that time. From these seas, missionaries spread the gospel to the whole world. Carthage in the... No, that's wrong. There was already believers in other places other than those three uh, places. North Africa, along with Gaul and England, were converted by missionaries from Rome. After the apostles die, their disciples, known as the Apostolic Fathers, continue to lead the church. Uh, they, they're not apostolic fathers. The apostolic fathers were the originals. The These are uh, disciples, just like the disciples were disciples, but the, uh, there was only 12 apostles that uh, the Lord called initially. Around the year 90, Pope Clement I of Rome writes to the Church of Corinth, rebuking certain instigators who had rebelled against the church's presbyters. Ignatius, Patriarch of Antioch. Well, they likely rebelled uh, because, you know, there was some false teaching or or they didn't want to follow the teaching, but uh, it doesn't really say why in this case. Antioch is condemned to be fed to beasts in the Colosseum in Rome early in the second century. On his journey, he writes letters to churches throughout the Mediterranean, encouraging them in the faith. Saint Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, in Asia near Ephesus, was a disciple of Saint John the Evangelist. He was cast into a fire in 155. When the fire failed to harm him, he was run through with a sword. Notice no mention of a pope. The second century would see the successors of the apostles seek not only to justify Christianity against arguments from a skeptical Greek world, but also rebuke heretics who sought to teach a distorted, twisted version of the Gospel. Valentinus attempted to lead astray the churches at Alexandria and Rome. Valentinus taught that only his disciples who received a special type of secret knowledge, 
called Gnosis would achieve true spiritual salvation. Yeah, we know that's false. And if we read the the Gnostic Gospels, there it's pretty obvious that they don't fall in line with what the Lord has taught, and His Holy Spirit bears witness that it is false. Marcion came to Rome shortly after Valentinus and attempted to persuade Christians that the God of the Old Testament was not the same as the God of the New Testament. Marcion taught that the God of the Old Testament was an evil being called the Demiurge, and that the Demiurge had created the physical world as a prison for souls who had fallen from the pure spiritual world. Marcion taught that the true God had sent an enlightened spirit, Jesus Christ, in the appearance of a human to rescue fallen souls from the corrupt physical world and lead them into a pure non-physical spiritual world. The teaching that Jesus was a divine spirit without a real human body became known as docetism. Yeah, that's false. Justin Martyr was born in Samaria. After studying philosophy, he was converted to Christianity by an old man along the seashore. He then travelled through Asia, answering objections to Christianity raised by Jews and Greeks, and refuting the teachings of Martial. He finally came to Rome, where during the reign of Marcus Aurelius, he was denounced by Cynic philosopher Crescens. Justin was beheaded in Rome in the year 168. Irenaeus of Lyon was a... Yeah, Justin Martyr kind of seemed like more of an intellectual type. Did not really walk uh, like Jesus and the Apostles did in power. The disciple of Polycarp, who had been taught directly by St. John the Evangelist. After learning the faith from Polycarp, Irenaeus travelled from Asia to Gaul, where he became Bishop of Lyon. He wrote a grand treatise against the Gnostic system of Valentinus, against heresies, which is still preserved to this day. The three largest cities in the Roman Empire were Rome, Alexandria and Antioch. These cities had authority over their patriarchates. Notice the idea of authority begins at this time. There was no such idea of the authority of certain cities over the other provinces before because every other province initially was uh, they were all equal. They were all bis they all had bishops, and and Paul makes it clear, which in the case of Rome included all of the Western Roman Empire, Italy, Africa, Illyricum, and Achaea. Alexandria had authority over Egypt, and Antioch had authority over churches in the Middle East. The bishops of Rome and Alexandria took the title of pope, while the bishop of Antioch took the title of patriarch. These bishops based their authority on direct succession from the Apostle Peter, who was... Notice uh, there's a difference between the Patriarch and the Pope. So there was differences from the beginning, but there was no idea of Pope. Before this time, there was... No, there, they, they began to... It seems like they began to operate in more of a lordship type of model here around this time, which is well after uh, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is like 200 years after. Bishop at Antioch for eight years, sent his disciple Mark the Evangelist to Alexandria as its first bishop, and finally gave his life for the faith at Rome. Administration of church governance was further subdivided among larger regional cities. The bishops of the largest cities were called exarchs, while the bishops of smaller regional cities were called metropolitans. And see this idea of lordship and more authority begins. You had supervision over bishops in their surrounding areas. In the late second century in Phrygia, a recent convert to Christianity named Montanus started a new movement emphasizing ecstasies and continued revelation from the Holy Spirit. The new prophecy movement spread throughout the church. Many bishops condemned the movement but there was not a formal church-wide condemnation. Well, there is a continued revelation from the Holy Spirit, but it does not change the teachings of Christ. And they were, in a sense, correct, because this is what the, what the apostles believed as well. They sought revelation from the Holy Spirit, and then when Peter... Uh, didn't know that the Gentiles would receive the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit fell on them. 
then he got a new revelation that God also wanted uh, you know Gentiles to be saved one of the first early feuds within the church was Corto Decumanism. In Asia, the followers of St. John the Evangelist celebrated Easter on the 14th of the Jewish month of Nisan, regardless of the day of the week, while the rest of the church celebrated Easter on Sunday. After the church in Asia refused to change to celebrating Easter on Sunday, Pope Victor I threatened to excommunicate them, but Irenaeus, who was from Asia, intervened and asked Victor to show leniency. In time, the Corto Decuman practice died out, and the entire church came to celebrate Easter on Sunday. Around the year 190, yeah. Theodotus of Byzantium. Uh, I think that point is doesn't really make a lot of sense to argue about. Just pretty foolish. Antium introduced the heresy known as Adoptionism, the teaching that Jesus was born a mere man, and was later adopted by God as His Son. Theodotus was excommunicated by Pope Victor I. Yeah, that's false, obviously. In the late 2nd century, Clement of Alexandria began studying philosophy and Christianity in Greece and Cappadocia, before travelling to Alexandria where he wrote extensively and taught his student origin. Clement's writings are considered controversial because they went beyond established Christian orthodoxy. For example, Clement believed that matter was eternal and not created by God, which is false, obviously, and he should have been excommunicated. But of course, uh, he's one of the people that are embraced today. Early in the third century, by the Catholic Church, of course. Century, Sibelius introduced the heresy of modalism, teaching that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit were simply manifestations of God in different places and times. This is also known as patripassionism, the teaching that the Father suffered on the cross. Sibelius was excommunicated for heresy by Pope Callistus I in the year 220. Yeah, I think that, one, that one's pretty obvious as well. He was a disciple of Irenaeus and wrote the Philosophumina, the refutation of all heresies against the writings of Valentinus, Martian and other heretics. He was considered one of the greatest theologians of Rome and expected to become Pope. However, Zephyrinus was elected Pope instead and Hippolytus refused to accept the result becoming one of the first anti-popes. Hippolyt No, so here we see that there's an anti-pope, so there's been division in the church in the past, so it wasn't just uh, at some point in the 15th century when Protestants, Protestantism came along, there was a lot of disputes, as we see. Hippolytus and Pope Pontian were later both exiled by Emperor Maximinus Thrax to the mines of Sardinia where they reconciled and died together as martyrs. Tertullian lived in Carthage and was one of the first theologians to write extensively in Latin. He is also one of the first Christians to use the term Trinity. Tertullian was an apologist and wrote extensively against Gnosticism. In the latter part of his life, he is said to have joined the Montanists. Well, that's good. He read, his, he read the Bible and saw that continued revelation from the Holy Spirit was necessary. The apostles valued it. Origen was a student of Clement of Alexandria and wrote extensively from Alexandria. He developed an allegorical interpretation of scripture and his speculative theology wandered beyond the limits of orthodoxy, teaching the pre-existence of souls and the subordination of God the Son to God the Father. The pre-existence of souls uh, yeah, it sounds something like Mor Mormonism or or some false doctrine. And he was not excommunicated for, catered for this either. He was he's he's been embraced by many Catholics. But we'll see that uh, some people that taught the truth later on in this documentary that that taught the truth were excommunicated for preaching the truth. Around the year 250, Saint Denis preached the gospel in Paris where he was martyred. Saint Denis would later be honored as the patron saint of France. Novation was a scholarly theologian in the Roman church and expected to be elected pope. To his surprise, Cornelius was elected pope. Novation refused to accept the results and wrote to all the churches of the world claiming that he was the rightful pope. His Another anti-pope. Followers throughout the world became known as Novationists and were known for their extreme rigorism. 
refusing to allow Christians who apostatized during the Decian persecution to return to the church, and even taking the extreme position that any Christian who committed a mortal sin could not return to the church. Yeah, th that sounds like really um, cutthroat, and there's no grace in that. So that's a false teaching. Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, found himself in the middle of controversies over how to admit apostates and heretics to the church. Cyprian took the position that heretics needed to be rebaptized upon joining the church, but was rebuked by Pope Stephen I. Cyprian grew quarrelsome at this, exchanging angry letters against Pope Stephen with Familian, Bishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia. Pope Stephen threatened Familian with excommunication for refusing to adopt the Roman doctrine prohibiting second baptism. However, Pope Dionysius I of Alexandria intervened and convinced Stephen to show leniency. In the late 250s, a new persecution broke out under Emperor Valerian. Pope Stephen and his successor, Pope Sixtus II, were martyred. Cyprian was martyred in Carubis modern Corba. His last words were, thanks be to God. Paul of Samosata was Bishop of Antioch from the years 260 to 268. Paul taught the adoptionist heresy and was condemned by a council in Antioch led by Familian of Caesarea and sanctioned by Pope Dionysius of Alexandria. The decision of the council was ratified by Pope Dionysius of Rome and again by Pope Felix I. In the middle of the 3rd century in Ctesiphon, capital of the Sassanid Empire in Persia, a Jewish Christian Gnostic named Mani began teaching a new religion that he synthesized from Gnostic Christianity, Buddhism and Zoroastrianism. Although Mani died while imprisoned by the Zoroastrian rulers of the Sassanid Empire, his new religion spread incredibly fast, reaching Rome as early as the year 280. Even Augustine of Hippo was a Manichaean before he converted to Christianity. Manichaeism was intensely persecuted and died out in Europe by the 6th century although in parts of Central Asia it survived as late as the 14th century. Many neo-gnostic movements throughout history, such as the Cathars of Southern Europe in the 12th through 14th centuries, were based on Manichaeism. Yeah, that's false doctrine. The 4th century began with the worldwide persecution of the church by Emperor Diocletian, the final and bloodiest of ten great Roman persecutions of the church. The persecution came to an end with the Edicts of Toleration in the years 311 and 313, under emperors Galerius and then Constantine. Constantine converted to Christianity, but... Yeah, supposedly uh, Constantine converted to Christianity, but he was still murdering people after that point. So I really doubt it happened. I think he just uh, gave in because he knew that the, the Christian faith was uh, t taking a foothold on the empire. Did not make Christianity the state-mandated religion. Early in the 4th century, a priest in Alexandria named Arius began to teach that Jesus, prior to the Incarnation, was a created being, less than God, but the Father. Yeah, that's false. This produced great that is false. controversy throughout the church. Although Arius was exiled by Popes Peter and Alexander of Alexandria, Bishop Eusebius of Nicomedia championed the teachings of Arius at the imperial court of Emperor Constantine. Emperor See, they championed the teachings of Arius. Emperor Constantine summoned the Council of Nicaea in 325 to settle the Arian controversy and other issues in the church. Bishop Hosius of Cordoba in Spain represented... <coughs> yeah, they just surpassed uh, the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit doesn't guide into all truth, but this council does, which contradicts the teachings of the scripture. And we don't know how many of these people had the Holy Spirit. Or Pope yeah, Sylvester. The we don't know. The first, as papal legate, and presided over the council. According to Athanasius, Hosius wrote the Nicene Creed that was adopted by the council and established the doctrine that the Father and the Son were consubstantial, having the same undivided substance or essence. The Council of Nicaea also confirmed the hierarchy of church governance in which Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch were acknowledged as the highest seas in the church. Notice Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch were established as the highest seas in the church. 
not by the original apostles, as we've seen already. Church. Following the council, Bishop Eusebius of Nicomedia and Arius were banished by Emperor Constantine. However, Eusebius was a skilled politician and quickly rewon the emperor's favour. Constantine brought Eusebius back from exile and made Eusebius his chief religious advisor. At the request of Eusebius, Constantine began deposing bishops who upheld the Orthodox Nicene faith, including Eustathius of Antioch in 330 and Athanasius of Alexandria in 335. Constantius of Alexandria, Let's go back to Eustathius, that. Constantine made Eusebius his chief religious advisor. At the request of Eusebius, Constantine began deposing bishops who upheld the Orthodox Nicene faith, including Eustathius of Antioch in 330 and Athanasius of Alexandria in 335. Constantine's successor in the Eastern Empire, Constantius II, supported Arianism and made Eusebius bishop of the new imperial capital Constantinople in the year 339. Constantius was a committed Arian and opposed bishops who adhered to the Nicene Creed. Constantius was a committed Arian. See, he was a committed Arian. His successor. And opposed bishops who adhered to the Nicene Creed. These bishops fled to the protection of Pope Julius I in Rome, who restored them to their sees. In 350, Emperor Constantius became sole emperor and suppressed the church in Rome, banishing Pope Liberius for two years. Oh, so here, here we see a division where the emperor determines uh, what's right. Constantius' successor in the east, Valens, continued to support Arianism. Ulfilas, the Goth who studied Christianity in Cappadocia, was sent by Eusebius of Nicomedia to teach the Arian faith to the Gothic tribes of Europe. Ulfilas successfully converted the Goths to Arianism and became their bishop. Ulfilas also translated the Bible into Gothic and developed the Gothic alphabet. Ulfilas wrote an Arian creed, which declared that the Holy Spirit was not God, that the Holy Spirit was subject and obedient in all things to the Son, and that the Son was subject and obedient in all things to the Father. Yeah, we know that's false. At the Third Council of Sirmium in 357, a council of the Church rejected the Nicene Creed, declared that the Father and the Son were not consubstantial, and in fact that the Father was greater than the Son. Pope Liberius of Rome was exiled for refusing to accept the Arian doctrine, although he was released two years later, and continued to uphold the Orthodox Nicene faith. In the year 330, Eustathius, Patriarch of Antioch, a staunch supporter of the Nicene Creed, was deposed at the request of Eusebius of Nicomedia. In the following decades, the Emperor would continue to appoint Arian bishops over Antioch, while Orthodox Christians in the city became divided between the successors of Paulinus, an Orthodox Nicene Christian, and Miletius, whose initial position was not clear, but who taught Orthodox Nicene Christianity by the end of his life, supporting Gregory of Nazianzus, and presiding over the First Council of Constantinople in the year 381. It took until early in the 5th century for the followers of Paulinus to accept the successors of Miletius. Arianism continued to flourish until Emperor Theodosius ascended the imperial throne in the year 379. Theodosius expelled the Arian bishop of Constantinople and appointed Gregory Nazianzen leader of a small group of Orthodox Nicene Christians. So notice that uh, the bishop or the emperor decided who became bishop. Well, of course he was right in this case because Arianism was a false doctrine. Christians, bishop of Constantinople. The city's Arian populace rioted in protest. In 380, Theodosius issued the Edict of Thessalonica, which commanded the entire Roman Empire to submit to the Orthodox Christian faith that St. Peter had taught to the Romans, and that had been faithfully preserved by Pope Damasus of Rome. So see, this was, a, this was one of the first, uh, some of the, one of the major um, schisms within the church, the Arian, the, the Arian heresy, and then here the emperor forces people uh, to worship a certain way, which I wouldn't say 
is wrong, but I wouldn't say it was it was right to try to force people to worship something that they don't want to worship. And Pope Peter of Alexandria, Emperor Theodosius subsequently made Arianism illegal throughout the empire. So he made it illegal, and then so now it's a state religion. Now it's not, it's not the, the the same as, you know, Jesus. You know, he didn't force all the Pharisees to believe like he did. At the Council of Constantinople, 150 bishops, all from the East, ratified the Orthodox Nicene faith and rebuked the heresies of Pneumatomachianism, the teaching that the Holy Spirit was less than the Father and the Son, and Apollinarianism, the teaching that the highest part of the soul of Jesus was replaced by the divine Logos. However, Apollinarian writers had written many forgeries under the names of Orthodox Fathers, such as Athanasius, which included statements to the effect that Jesus had one nature, one energy and one will. Miletius of Antioch died while presiding over the council. The Council of Constantinople, without the consent of the churches of Rome and Alexandria, elevated Constantinople to the second highest see in the church after Rome, based on its status as the new capital of the empire. The attempt by Constantinople to elevate itself over Alexandria and Antioch would produce infighting between Constantinople, Alexandria and Antioch in the coming decades that eventually led to all-out schism. And that's where we see the first schism, uh, well, the first visible schism between the, the East and the West. The fifth century began with conflict between the seas of Constantinople, Alexandria and Antioch. Saint John Chrysostom, a priest from Antioch, was named Bishop of Constantinople in 403. Theophilus, Pope of Alexandria, feared Antioch's influence over the imperial court at Constantinople and sought to depose Chrysostom. Although Theophilus was initially unsuccessful, Chrysostom eventually lost favour with the Empress and was deposed and exiled. He appealed for help from Pope Innocent I in Rome, who excommunicated the officials of Constantinople for their treatment of Chrysostom. Chrysostom died in exile. Meanwhile, the Western Empire was collapsing and Rome was sacked by the Arian Visigoths in 410. The Visigoths then relocated to Spain. During this time, St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, led the church in Africa. Augustine combated the Donatists, who, similar to the Novationists, challenged the right of apostates to administer sacraments, as well as Pelagians, who asserted that the sacraments were not necessary for people who were strong enough to live a holy life through their own effort. In addition, the bishops of Africa became increasingly frustrated by appeals from their subjects to the Pope in Rome and forbade this practice at the Council of Carthage in 419. This quarrel culminated in the Optoremus in 426, a letter written by the African bishops to Pope Celestine I, in which they angrily objected to the Pope interfering in the judicial discipline of the churches in Africa. It was the Novation led to the Visigoths in 410. The Visigoths then relocated to Spain. During this time, St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, led the church in Africa. Augustine combated the Donatists, who, similar to the Novationists, challenged the right of apostates to administer sacraments, as well as Pelagians, who asserted that the sacraments were not necessary for people who were strong enough to live a holy life through their own effort. In addition, the bishops of Africa became increasingly frustrated by appeals from their subjects to the Pope in Rome, and forbade this practice at the Council of Carthage in 419. This quarrel culminated in the Optoremus in 426, a letter written by the African bishops to Pope Celestine I, in which they angrily objected to the Pope interfering in the judicial discipline of the churches in Africa. The quarrel was brought to an end by the conquest of North Africa by the Vandals in the years 429 to 439. The Vandals were Arian and oppressed the local Catholics. Saint Augustine died during the siege of Hippo by the Vandals in the year 430. The feud between Constantinople, Alexandria and Antioch resumed with the appointment of Nestorius, a priest from Antioch, to the bishopric of Constantinople in 428. Nestorius was from a theological school in Antioch that emphasised the humanity of Christ, 
and sought to explain how the human Jesus became united to the divine Logos. Christians in this time were honoring Mary as the Theotokos, the mother of God. But Nestorius opposed this practice, saying that Mary was merely the mother of Christ. Yeah, and he was right. But he was excommunicated, unlike Origen and, and, uh, and uh, Clement of Alexandria. Nestorius was accused of heresy by Pope Cyril of Alexandria. Cyril received approval from Pope Celestine in Rome to depose Nestorius at the Council of Ephesus in 431. Patriarch John I of Antioch, no doubt perturbed that Alexandria was deposing an Antiochian bishop of Constantinople for the second time in 30 years, at first refused to accept the council, setting up his own rival council. However, John eventually relented and agreed to the deposition of Nestorius. Saint Cyril of Alexandria's writings on the Nestorian controversy became widely celebrated throughout the Eastern Church, including in the region of Antioch. The followers of Nestorius at first congregated around the school of Edessa, but in 489 were forced by Byzantine Emperor Zeno to flee to the Sassanid Empire in Persia. The Sassanid Empire was happy to tolerate Christians in its borders as long as they were in schism with the religion of its primary enemy, the Byzantine Empire. And so the Church of the East became Nestorian and spread as far east as China in the following centuries. St. Patrick was raised in Roman-occupied England, but at the age of 14 was kidnapped by Irish raiders and forced into slavery as a shepherd. St. Patrick escaped Ireland and entered a monastery in Gaul, eventually returning to Ireland and converting the Irish to Christianity. In his writings, St. Cyril of Neophysis, Napolitan, that asserted that in his writings, Saint Cyril of Alexandria had quoted an Apollinarian forgery. In his writings, Saint Cyril of Alexandria had quoted an Apollinarian forgery that asserted that Jesus had one nature, mere thesis. His successor, Pope Dioscorus of Alexandria, believed this to be the historic teaching of the Church. Dioscorus saw a third opportunity for Alexandria to depose the Bishop of Constantinople when Bishop Flavian condemned the monk Eutyches for teaching that Jesus had one nature. Eutyches and Flavian both appealed to Pope Leo I of Rome. Meanwhile, Dioscorus won the ear of Emperor Theodosius II, who allowed Dioscorus and Bishop Juvenal of Jerusalem to convene the Robber Council of Ephesus in 449, which deposed both Flavian and Pope Leo. Emperor Theodosius died within a year, and the new Emperor Marcion was loyal to Pope Leo. Leo called for a new council, See, they were loyal to the Pope, so that gave them more authority, that gave them more position of power. That has nothing to do with Christianity. Wrote the famous Leo's Tome, which set forth the orthodox doctrine of Christology that the Church has upheld to the present day. The hypostatic union, Jesus is one person with two natures, fully God and fully man. Two perfect natures without confusion, without mixture, without separation without change, in one person. The Council of Chalcedon accepted Leo's tome in 451 and deposed Dioscorus. The tension between Constantinople, Alexandria and Antioch erupted into outright schism following the Council of Chalcedon. In addition to the Miaphysite controversy, the Council of Chalcedon had attempted to make several important changes in church governance. First, in exchange for Bishop Juvenal of Jerusalem returning to the Catholic faith, accepted Leo's tome in 451 and deposed Dioscorus. The tension between Constantinople, Alexandria and Antioch erupted into outright schism following the Council of Chalcedon. In addition to the Miaphysite controversy, the Council of Chalcedon had attempted to make several without Let's go back to the Council of Chalcedon. To depose, quoted as a monasterian ford in his writings, St. Cyril of Alexandria had quoted an Apollinarian forgery that asserted that Jesus had one nature, Neophysis. His successor, Pope Dioscorus of Alexandria, believed this to be the historic teaching of the Church. Dioscorus saw a third opportunity for Alexandria to depose the Bishop of Constantinople when Bishop Flavian condemned the monk Eutyches for teaching that Jesus had one nature. Eutyches and Flavian both appealed to Pope Leo I of Rome. Meanwhile, Dioscorus won the ear of Emperor Theodosius II, who allowed Dioscorus and Bishop Juvenal of Jerusalem 
to convene the Robber Council of Ephesus in 449, which deposed both Flavian and Pope Leo. Emperor Theodosius died within a year, and the new emperor, Marcion, was loyal to Pope Leo. Leo called for a new council and wrote the famous Leo's Tome, which set forth the orthodox doctrine of Christology that the church has upheld to the present day. The hypostatic union, Jesus is one person with two natures, fully God and fully man. Two perfect natures without confusion, without mixture, without separation, without change, in one person. The Council of Chalcedon accepted Leo's tome in 451 and deposed Dioscorus. The tension between Constantinople, Alexandria and Antioch erupted into outright schism following the Council of Chalcedon. In addition to the Miaphysite controversy, the Council of Chalcedon had attempted to make several important changes in church governance. First, in exchange for Bishop Juvenal of Jerusalem returning to the Catholic faith, Jerusalem was elevated to a patriarchate, with Palestine Yes, it should be. Jerusalem is very important. ...removed from the Patriarchate of Antioch. Next, the Council of Chalcedon made Constantinople the final court of appeal for bishops in the east, and elevated Constantinople to a Patriarchate over the regions of Thrace, Asia and Pontus. Most importantly, the Council of Chalcedon attempted to make Constantinople the second highest see in the church, above Alexandria and Antioch just as the Council of Constantinople had tried to do so. I don't know why they made Antioch and Alexandria above Jerusalem. 70 years earlier, Pope Leo was outraged that Constantinople had upset the hierarchy of the established Petrine sees of Rome, Alexandria and Antioch that had been fixed by the Council of Nicaea. He refused to accept the proposed changes and rebuked Bishop Anatolius of Constantinople for using the Myophysite controversy as an excuse to usurp power. The people of Alexandria were even more outraged. The Council of Chalcedon had banished their Pope Dioscorus and installed Proterius as bishop. An angry mob in Alexandria killed Proterius and installed Timothy, a zealous Myophysite, as Pope of Alexandria. In Syria and Palestine, Chalcedon was rejected by the local people. The first great schism in the church had begun. The people of Egypt and Syria, Copts and Syriacs, formed the Oriental Orthodox Communion and would continue to the present day to elect their own Myophysite patriarchs in opposition to the imperial Melkite patriarchs appointed by the emperor from Constantinople. At the time of Chalcedon, Attila the Hun conquered Central Europe and was poised to sack Rome. But Pope Leo rode out to meet them and persuaded Attila to spare the city. Meanwhile, the Vandals aggressively conquered the western half of the Mediterranean, capturing Sicily Sardinia and Corsica. In 455, the Vandals sacked Rome, the second sacking in 45 years, although Pope Leo persuaded them to spare the city's inhabitants. In the last great joint military campaign of the Western and Eastern Roman Empire, a massive armada of Byzantine and Roman ships was destroyed by the Vandals at the Battle of Cartagena in 468. The Byzantine Empire was left bankrupt and the Western Empire was deprived of its source of grain from Africa. In 471, Peter the Fuller, Myophysite Patriarch of Antioch, introduced the Nicene Creed as modified by the Council of Constantinople in 381 into the liturgy at Antioch in protest of the Council of Chalcedon. Although the creed was originally used in this way to protest the Council of Chalcedon, its use in liturgy spread throughout the church and by the 11th century was used by the Church of Rome. In 482, Byzantine Emperor Zeno attempted to placate the Myophysite factions in Alexandria and Antioch by issuing a statement of faith called the Henoticon, which approved the writings of Cyril of Alexandria, but did not mention the Council of Chalcedon or Leo's Tome. Pope Felix III of Rome condemned the Henoticon, but bishops Acacius of Constantinople, Peter the Fuller of Antioch, and Peter Mongus of Alexandria accepted it. Pope Felix therefore excommunicated all three of them. Which used the Antioch read as not one of its source of grain. Myophysite Patriarch of Antioch introduced the Nicene Creed as modified by the Council of Constantinople in 381 into the liturgy at Antioch in protest of the Council of Chalcedon. Although the creed was originally used in this way to protest the Council of Chalcedon, its use in liturgy spread throughout the church and by the 11th century was used by the Church of Rome. 
In 482, Byzantine Emperor Zeno attempted to placate the Miaphysite factions in Alexandria and Antioch by issuing a statement of faith called the Henoticon, which approved the writings of Cyril of Alexandria, but did not mention the Council of Chalcedon or Leo's tome. Pope Felix III of Rome condemned the Henoticon, but bishops Acacius of Constantinople, Peter the Fuller of Antioch, and Peter Mongus of Alexandria accepted it. Pope Felix therefore excommunicated all three of them, beginning the Acacian Schism that would last until 519. Felix is often quoted as saying, not to oppose error is to approve it, and not to defend truth is to suppress it, and indeed to neglect to confound evil men when we can do it is no less a sin than to encourage them. In four Yeah, but uh, just uh, excommunicating people on your own as if you have all authority is not right either without some type of counsel. 176, the last Western Roman Emperor, Romulus Augustus, was overthrown by his general, Odoacer, who established the Kingdom of Italy. In 493, Theodoric the Great, an Arian and King of the Ostrogoths, defeated and killed Odoacer. I'm gonna go back to this one. ...proof the writings used by the Church of Rome. Rosino attempted to placate the Miaphysite factions in Alexandria and Antioch by issuing a statement of faith called the Henoticon which approved the writings of Cyril of Alexandria, but did not mention the Council of Chalcedon or Leo's tome. Pope Felix III of Rome condemned the Henoticon, but bishops Acacius of Constantinople, Peter the Fuller of Antioch, and Peter Mongus of Alexandria accepted it. Pope Felix therefore excommunicated all three of them, beginning the Acacian Schism that would last until 519. Well, I mean, what gave him all the authority? over the eastern churches the eastern churches were closer to the the region where jesus was from where the original churches were founded felix is often quoted as saying not to oppose error is to approve it and not to defend truth is to suppress it and indeed to neglect to confound evil men when we can do it is no less a sin than to encourage them in 470 26. The last Western Roman Emperor, Romulus Augustus, was overthrown by his general, Odoacer, who established the Kingdom of Italy. In 493, Theodoric the Great, an Arian and King of the Ostrogoths, defeated and killed Odoacer, and established Ostrogothic rule over Italy. Odoacer's final words were, Where is God? 500 years after the birth of Jesus, Orthodox Christianity was on the verge of extinction. Aryan kingdoms had conquered all of Europe, Italy, Gaul, Spain, and North Africa. The Byzantine Empire had rejected Leo's tome and embraced Miaphysitism. Rome alone stood for the Orthodox Catholic faith, surrounded on all sides by Aryans and Miaphysites. Rome had been sacked twice in the past century and was now under the rule of an Aryan kingdom. In the coming century, Rome would be brought to the brink of annihilation as the armies of Constantinople and the Ostrogoths descended upon it. But a new light began to shine in 508, when King Clovis I of the Franks was baptised as a Catholic. The darkness receded further in 519, when Byzantine Emperor Justin I, unable to maintain ecclesiastical union with Syria and Egypt, sought reunion with Rome and compelled his bishops to submit to the formula of Pope Hormisdas, which affirmed Leo's tome and declared that all who did not agree with the Bishop of Rome were not in communion with the Catholic Church. However, the Miaphysites in Syria and Egypt refused to accept the formula Leo's Tome or the Council of Chalcedon. The Catholic Church finally brought an end to the Pelagian controversy at the Council of Orange in 529, which condemned semi-Pelagianism, the doctrine that humans of their own effort without the help of the grace of God can come to faith in the desire for baptism. In the East, new Byzantine Emperor Justinian I began a campaign to recapture the Western Empire, beginning with the successful conquest of North Africa from the Vandals in 533. Justinian then sought to conquer Italy from the Ostrogoths. He captured an effort without the help of the grace of God can come to faith in the desire for baptism. 
In the East, new Byzantine refused to accept the formula Leo's Tome or the Council of Chalcedon. The Catholic Church finally brought an end to the Pelagian controversy at the Council of Orange in 529, which condemned semi-Pelagianism, the doctrine that humans of their own effort without the help of the grace of God can come to faith in the desire for baptism. In the East, new Byzantine Emperor Justinian I began a campaign to recapture the Western Empire, beginning with the successful conquest of North Africa from the Vandals in 533. Justinian then sought to conquer Italy from the Ostrogoths. He captured Rome in 536, but the Ostrogoths counterattacked and besieged the city in 538, and finally sacked the city in 546. The Byzantines retook the city, but the Ostrogoths sacked it a second time in 549. The Byzantines finally captured Rome for good in 552. The constant fighting left Rome almost completely destroyed. From a population of over a million people at the time of the Apostles Peter and Paul, the population of Rome fell to a mere 50,000. Justinian's ambitions were disrupted in 541 when plague broke out in Constantinople, rapidly spreading across the Byzantine Empire. 10,000 people a day died in Constantinople. Justinian himself was infected but survived. The Byzantine Empire was greatly weakened. Monasteries in Italy during this time were frequently relaxed places where members of wealthy aristocratic families lived a life of leisure. Saint Benedict attempted to change this by introducing the Rule of Saint Benedict, which established a strict regimen of work, prayer and study. Benedict's rule was so strict that one monastery attempted to poison him twice. Over the next five centuries, the Rule of Saint Benedict would become the predominant rule of monastic life in Western Europe. While the Ostrogoths were besieging Rome in 545, Emperor Justinian brought Pope Vigilius I to Constantinople, where he stayed at the Placidia Palace and was safe from the constant fighting that was destroying Rome. At Constantinople, Emperor Justinian put him first and rested over the next wall and was greatly weakened. People a day died in Constantinople. Justinian himself was infected but survived. The Byzantine Empire was greatly weakened. Monasteries in Italy during this time were frequently relaxed places where members of wealthy aristocratic families lived a life of leisure. Saint Benedict attempted to change this by introducing the Rule of Saint Benedict, which established a strict regimen of work, prayer and study. Benedict's rule was so strict that one monastery attempted to poison him twice. Over the next five centuries, the rule of Saint Benedict would become the predominant rule of monastic life in Western Europe. While the Ostrogoths were besieging Rome in 545, Emperor Justinian brought Pope Vigilius I to Constantinople, where he stayed at the Placidia Palace and was safe from the constant fighting that was destroying Rome. At Constantinople, Emperor Justinian put pressure on Pope Vigilius to condemn the three chapters, certain Nestorian writings from the previous century. Justinian believed their condemnation would help bring reunion with the Miaphysites in Syria and Egypt. The writers of the three chapters had died in the previous century, and two of the writers had been reconciled to the church at the Council of Chalcedon. Pope Vigilius was reluctant to posthumously condemn these writers, but eventually consented to the condemnation issued by the Fifth Ecumenical Council in 553. In 555, three years after Rome had been safely restored to the Byzantine Empire, Pope Vigilius left Constantinople for Rome, but died on the journey. The Byzantine Empire was severely weakened by the plague and decades of fighting the Ottomans. The Byzantine Empire, years after Rome had Chalcedon died, Justinian believed the palace had become the predominant rule of monastic life in Western Europe. While the Ostrogoths were besieging Rome in 545, Emperor Justinian brought Pope Vigilius I to Constantinople, where he stayed at the Placidia Palace and was safe from the constant fighting that was destroying Rome. At Constantinople, Emperor Justinian put pressure on Pope Vigilius to condemn the three chapters, certain Nestorian writings from the previous century. Justinian believed their condemnation would help bring reunion with the Miaphysites in Syria and Egypt. 
The writers of the three chapters had died in the previous century, and two of the writers had been reconciled to the church at the Council of Chalcedon. Pope Vigilius was reluctant to posthumously condemn these writers, but eventually consented to the condemnation, issued by the Fifth Ecumenical Council in 553. In 555, three years after Rome had been safely restored to the Byzantine Empire, Pope Vigilius left Constantinople for Rome, but died on the journey. The Byzantine Empire was severely weakened by the plague and decades of fighting the Ostrogoths, which allowed the Germanic Lombards to invade Italy in 568. The Lombards conquered most of the peninsula except for the Exarchate of Ravenna, a narrow corridor from Ravenna, the capital, to Rome. The Byzantine Emperor continued to rule the Exarchate of Ravenna and required his consent to all elections of the Pope, resulting in the era of the Byzantine Papacy. In 587, King Ricard I of the Visigoths converted from Arianism to Catholicism. Pope Gregory the Great reigned from 590 to 604. He reformed the church and sent missions throughout Europe. In 588, John the Faster, Bishop of Constantinople, claimed the title of Ecumenical Bishop or Universal Bishop, but Pope Gregory refused to permit the title, affirming papal supremacy and the rank of the three Petrine sees of Rome, Alexandria and Antioch, above Constantinople. In the east, the Byzantine Empire faced a new threat as a migrating tribe from Asia, the Avars, invaded the Balkans. Pagan Saxons had conquered England after the fall of the Roman Empire. Pope Gregory the Great sent Augustine of Canterbury to evangelise the Saxons in England, and Augustine became the first Archbishop of Canterbury in the year 597. In 602, war erupted between the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Empire. The Sassanid Empire gained early victories, conquering Antioch in 613, Jerusalem in 614, Anatolia in 617, and Alexandria in 618. However, the Byzantine Empire rallied under Emperor Heraclius and defeated the Sassanid Empire at the Battle of Nineveh in 628, regaining all of its lost territory. In the year 633, Melkite Patriarch Cyrus of Alexandria reached an agreement with the Coptic Church that there is one energy or faculty of action in Jesus, the doctrine of monothelitism. The monk Sophronius, who had become Patriarch of Jerusalem, staunchly opposed monothelitism and protested to Patriarch Sergius of Constantinople that there were two energies in Jesus, diothelitism. Sergius proposed to Pope Honorius I in Rome that the Church should prohibit the discussion of one or two energies altogether. Sergius mentioned as a side note that the doctrine of two energies might lead people to believe there are two contrary wills in Christ. Pope Honorius wrote back agreeing with the proposal to prohibit the discussion of one or two energies. Honorius also mentioned as a side note that Jesus has one will, because when Jesus assumed human nature, Jesus assumed the nature we had before Adam's fall, not our vitiated nature tainted by original sin. Honorius, personal secretary, successor Pope John IV, and Ma Well, I think that's wrong because it says in the Bible that, um, or in the scripture, that uh, he became like we were. So he did take on, uh, he did t take on the, uh, well, somewhat, because he took on the nature of sin when he was crucified on the cross but then he was tempted at all points but did not sin so even though he was innocent he took on the sins of the world so I think this is incorrect on the part of the uh, of Pope Pope Honorius I Maximus the Confessor defended these statements saying that Honorius had only denied the existence of a sinful will in Christ's human nature not the existence of a human will altogether. Meanwhile, in Mesopotamia, the Arab Muslim Rashidun Caliphate had risen up against the Byzantine and Sassanid empires. To the shock of both empires, the Arabs defeated the combined forces of the Sassanid and Byzantine empires in the Battle of Firaz in December 633. Ctesiphon, the capital of the Sassanid empire, 
fell in March 637. In the same year, the Rashidun Caliphate captured both Antioch and Jerusalem. With the borders of his empire collapsing, Emperor Heraclius was annoyed to find his bishops quarrelling over monothelitism. Honorius, Sergius and Sophronius all died in 638, and Heraclius issued the Ecthesis, which prohibited discussion of one or two energies in Christ, and affirmed that Jesus has only one will. The Melkite patriarchs of Constantinople, Antioch, who following the fall of Antioch to the Sassanid Empire, resided in Constantinople, and Alexandria, all affirmed the ecthesis. But Pope Severinus I condemned the ecthesis and affirmed that there are two energies and two wills in Jesus Christ, human and divine. Well, not necessarily true because the will of and the energy of Jesus was the same will of God, so um, they're the same will. There's one will. Jesus did the will of the Father. Of course, he had his own carnal will, but but he, he went in line with what God's will has said. So he said, not as I will, but as, your, as his will be done in the garden, he said, not as I will, but as you will. So in his flesh, he had he had his own will, but but he was obedient at all points. So it's partially true what he's saying. Alexandria fell to the Rashidun Caliphate in 641. Rome and Constantinople were the only seas that remained in the Byzantine Empire. They remained in schism for the next 40 years. Meanwhile, Myophysites in Syria and Egypt welcomed the Rashidun Caliphate as liberators and joined in the fight against the Byzantine Empire. Eager to bring an end to the quarrel among his bishops, Emperor Constance II in 648 issued the Typus, which ordered the church to cease all discussion of one or two wills or energies in Jesus. Pope Martin I refused to comply and was seized by Byzantine troops and died in prison after refusing to renounce diatheletism. Maximus the Confessor left Constantinople for Rome, but he too was arrested and died. So people were, were arrested and banished for just disagreeing with things that, uh, I mean, they're not fundamental doctrines, they're just, you know, your ideas. Sometimes you believe a certain way because you think a certain way. Died in prison for refusing to renounce diotheletism. And... As long as you're not believing something that's contrary to the teachings of uh, the cross, salvation, then you're good. Meanwhile, the Rashidun Caliphate was divided in a civil war and replaced by the Umayyad Caliphate in 661, which reached the outskirts of Carthage in 665. The Umayyad Caliphate conquered Anatolia and besieged Constantinople from 674 to 678. The Byzantine Empire used Greek fire against the Umayyad navy for the first time in recorded history. To add to the Byzantine Empire's troubles, a new tribe from Central Asia, the Bulgarians, had invaded Thrace in 670, pressing as far as Thessalonica. In Italy, King Aripert I of the Lombards converted from Arianism to Catholicism in 653. The Lombard kings remained firmly Catholic from the time of King Percturit, bringing an end to the Arian rulers of the Germanic tribes in Europe. Finally, in 680 to 681, Emperor Constantine IV submitted to Pope Agato I and convened the Sixth Ecumenical Council, which condemned monothelitism and affirmed diotheletism. By this point, the Myophysites in Egypt, Syria and Palestine were no longer part of the Byzantine Empire and the Emperor had little reason to continue compromising with them. The Sixth Ecumenical Council condemned Pope Honorius as a heretic for following Patriarch Sergius, but Pope Leo II changed the condemnation, condemning Honorius for negligence rather than heresy. In 692, the Byzantine Empire held a Council of Eastern Bishops in Constantinople, the Quinisex Council, also known as the Council in Trullo which condemned certain practices in the Western Church, including the depiction of Jesus as a lamb. When Pope Sergius I refused to accept the council, 
Emperor Justinian II sent soldiers to arrest the Pope, but Justinian's soldiers were repulsed by local militia in Ravenna, who were loyal to the Pope. In response to the Quinisex Council's prohibition of depictions of Jesus as a lamb, Pope Sergius introduced Agnus Dei into the liturgy of the Roman Mass. The Roman Church never accepted the Quinisex Council. The following year, the Umayyad Caliphate captured Carthage. They would complete the conquest of North Africa in the following decade. Monothelitesk. I guess that's kind of a, a null point. It's not really... I mean, it does say that he's the Lamb of God, so... I guess that was, that's uh, probably... Uh, fine. Continued to hold influence in Constantinople. In 711, Emperor Philippicos Bardanes ascended the throne and installed a monothelite, John VI, as Bishop of Constantinople, who convened a synod that revoked the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Pope Constantine excommunicated them. At the same time, Bulgarians plundered Thrace up to the walls of Constantinople, and the Byzantine army rebelled against Philippicos blinding him and installing his secretary as Emperor Anastasios. Anastasios reinstated the Sixth Ecumenical Council and deposed the monothelite Patriarch John VI, replacing him with the Orthodox Patriarch Germanus in 715. The Umayyad Caliphate invaded Spain in 711 and destroyed the Visigoths. The Umayyad Caliphate then invaded Gaul, where they met Charles Martel, Prince of the Franks, at the Battle of Tours in 732. Charles Martel defeated the Umayyad Caliphate, who retreated to Iberia, leaving Gaul under the control of the Franks. The Umayyad Caliphate laid siege to Constantinople from 717 to 719. Emperor Leo the Osorian enlisted the help of the Bulgarians who forced the Umayyad Caliphate to retreat. Leo feared that the empire had lost favour with God due to the veneration of icons. Well, he was right. Uh, God said not to worship graven images or venerate them. In 730, he issued an edict prohibiting the veneration of icons and installed an iconoclast Anastasios as Patriarch of Constantinople. Pope Gregory II condemned Leo's iconoclasm. Pope Leo condemned him for truth. And St. John of Damascus, living in Umayyad held Damascus, wrote a firm defense of the veneration of icons. There is no firm defense. It goes against scripture. It goes against the doctrines and teachings that God has already left us. Leo's successor, Constantine V, zealously enforced iconoclasm, declaring, He cannot be depicted, for what is depicted is one person and he who circumscribes that person has plainly circumscribed the divine nature, which is incapable of being circumscribed. That's true. You can't depict him. In February 754, Constantine convened a synod of Eastern bishops who voted in favour of iconoclasm. By the end of Constantine's reign, iconoclasm had gone as far as to brand relics and prayers to the saints as heretical. Me yeah, well that's good. Meanwhile, with the Byzantine Empire distracted by wars against the Bulgarians and Muslims, Lombard King Eistolf captured Ravenna in 751, ending over two centuries of Byzantine rule. Following the Lombard conquest of Ravenna, Pope Zachary appealed for help from Pepin the Younger, whom he crowned King of the Franks. The Franks invaded Italy and conquered the Lombards, and granted most of the former exarchate of Ravenna to the Pope as his temporal domain which would become known as the Papal States. This marked a significant new era in the papacy. The Papal States... Yeah, that's not, 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 not a scriptural, not, uh, you know, that's lordship. Not being a servant, that's being served, being a king. It's not what Jesus set us out to do. Which, for the previous 200 years, had been under the relatively stable protection of the Byzantine Empire. For the next 800 years, the papacy would find itself at the center of seemingly unending conflicts between Italian principalities and Europe's great powers. The popes of Rome continued... Well, yeah, because it allowed itself to be ruled by them. ...to oppose Byzantine iconoclasm, 
Emperor Constantine VI finally relented and allowed the Seventh Ecumenical Council to meet in 787. The council had to meet in Nicaea, site of the First Ecumenical Council in 325, because the city of Constantinople was under iconoclast rule. The Seventh Ecumenical Council agreed to the demands of Pope Adrian I and affirmed the orthodoxy of the veneration of icons of Jesus, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the angels and the saints. Yeah, they affirmed something that wasn't affirmed by the apostles. I think orthodoxy was uh, correct in initially uh, being against this. Uh. On Christmas Day in 800, Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne, Holy Roman Emperor, at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. While the Byzantine Empire saw it as a betrayal, since it had been the guardian of the faith for the past 400 years, the Pope hoped it would usher in a new era of stability and independence and free the papacy from outside political meddling. Instead, Charlemagne's empire would quickly splinter after his death and the papacy would find itself at the mercy of whichever Italian principality happened to have the most power at any particular moment. In 823, King Harald Klack of Denmark was baptised and Catholic missionaries continued to spread the gospel in Norway and Sweden. In 815, Byzantine Emperor Leo V reinstituted iconoclasm. Pope Pascal I offered persecuted Byzantine monks refuge in Rome. Saint Theodore the Studite in Constantinople wrote zealously against iconoclasm. Finally, in 843, Byzantine Emperor Michael III deposed the iconoclast patriarch John VII of Constantinople, replacing him with Patriarch Methodius I which brought an end to Constantinople's second era of iconoclasm. In 827, the Abbasid Caliphate launched an invasion of Sicily and southern Italy, which had been under Byzantine rule. In 846, the Anglobits, vassals of the Abbasid Caliphate, and known to Italy as Saracens, landed in central Italy and defeated the local Roman militia. The Saracens plundered all of Rome outside the Aurelian Wall, including St. Peter's Basilica, where Pope Leo III had crowned Charlemagne Holy Roman Emperor just 46 years earlier. In response, Pope Leo IV called together a fleet from neighbouring Italian principalities that defeated the Saracen navy at the Battle of Ostia in 849. Missionaries Cyril and Methodius converted the Slavic tribes of Central Europe in Great Moravia and Pannonia from 862 to 885 and brought these tribes into communion with Rome. In 858, Patriarch Ignatius of Constantinople was deposed, and a layman, Photius, was appointed Patriarch by Emperor Michael III. Ignatius and Photius both appealed to Pope Nicholas I, who recognised Ignatius as rightful Patriarch. Rome and Constantinople fell into schism until 867, when Nicholas died and Photius was deposed by new Emperor Basil I. In 864, Khan Boris I of Bulgaria was baptised into the Catholic faith and sought competing offers from Rome and Constantinople as to which patriarchate he should belong to. In 869, the Fourth Council of Constantinople affirmed the deposition of Photius and prohibited criticism of the Pope. It also affirmed the veneration of images of Jesus, his mother Mary, the angels and the saints, and recognised Constantinople as the second highest seat of the Mary of Christine, patriarchate the council should belong to. In 869, the Fourth Council of Constantinople affirmed the deposition of images of Jesus and prohibited criticism, the fourth that he should belong to. In 869, the Fourth Council of Constantinople affirmed the deposition of Photius and prohibited criticism of the Pope. It also affirmed the veneration of images of Jesus. Prohibited. What? Jesus. In 869, the Fourth Council of Constantinople affirmed the deposition of Photius and prohibited criticism of the Pope. Prohibited criticism of the Pope. Well, Peter was criticized by Paul, so we know that's false. It also affirmed the veneration of images of Jesus, his mother Mary, the angels, and the saints. Yeah, and it affirmed uh, things that are false because the apostles did not teach that, and neither did the Jews, so... Uh, yeah, can affirm all you want, but it's not lining up with the teachings that have been passed by the original apostles, not these uh, 
so-called apostles. And recognized Constantinople as the second highest see in the church. Photius became Patriarch of Constantinople for a second time in 877 and held a council in 879, revoking the Council of 869. The Council of 879 was not accepted by Rome. In the 9th century, the pagan Magyars migrated from Central Asia to Eastern Europe and conquered present-day Hungary, from where they launched raids against the scattered principalities of the former Carolingian Empire. At the same time, Vikings from Scandinavia harassed the coast of Northern Europe and England. The Carolingian Empire had been established with the crowning of Charlemagne in 800, but his successors were unable to keep the empire united. The Carolingian Empire split apart for good in 888. In the absence of a strong central power in Western Europe, the papacy found itself at the mercy of local Italian principalities, while the Abbasid Caliphate conquered Sicily and central Italy, coming within striking distance of Rome. Leo VI became Byzantine Emperor in 886. He banished Photius and liberated southern Italy from the Abbasid Caliphate, but lost Sicily and failed in an attempt to retake Crete. In 907 and 911, Kievan Rus laid siege to Constantinople, forcing the negotiation of a favourable trade treaty. Although Photius had attempted to convert Kievan Rus to Christianity, the king and a majority of the people remained pagan until the end of the 10th century. Norse Vikings had been raiding Northern Europe since 820. In 911, Charles III, King of West Francia, negotiated an agreement with Viking leader Rollo that granted the Vikings territory in northern France, which became known as the Duchy of Normandy. The Normans would come to play a major part in church history in the coming centuries. The disintegration of the Carolingian Empire allowed Count Theophylact of Tusculum in Italy to attain de facto rule over Rome. Theophylact and his family used their power to control elections to the papacy in the earth. Yeah, control elections to the papacy. Yeah, like that's not going to bring corruption. Sure did. The 10th century, an era called the Seculum Obscurum, the Dark Age of the Papacy. Dark While Age Rome of the Papacy. Was dominated by the Count of Tusculum. Yeah, and false teaching did get added in that time. Monasticism and church discipline declined across Europe as the Carolingian Empire disintegrated into countless separate fiefdoms. In 910, Saint Bernard became abbot of the new Abbey of Cluny and immediately enforced a strict interpretation of the rule of Saint Benedict. In the following century, a new line of popes would emerge from Cluny Abbey to reform the church and defy the Holy Roman Emperor. The Abbasid Caliphate captured central Italy in the late 9th century, threatening Rome itself. In 915, Italian forces under the command of Pope John X and Byzantine forces from southern Italy attacked the main Abbasid fortress on the Garigliano River in central Italy. The Abbasids were defeated and driven from mainland Italy back to Sicily. Otto, Duke of Saxony, united the German territories of the former Carolingian Empire and restored the Holy Roman Empire. Otto brought an end to the Magyar raids against Europe with his victory at the Battle of Lechfeld in 955, earning him the reputation as the saviour of Christendom. In 961, Otto conquered Italy and was crowned Holy Roman Emperor at St. Peter's Basilica in 962. Holy Roman Emperor. <laughs> a warmonger. Otto also negotiated a peace that permitted the Byzantine Empire to retain southern Italy. More kingdoms of Northern and Eastern Europe converted to Christianity in the 10th century. In 966, Miesko, Duke of Poland was baptized. In 988, Vladimir the Great, Grand Prince of Kiev was baptized. In 995, Olaf Tryggvason became the first Christian King of Norway. Sweden and Magyar Hungary remained two of the few pagan countries left in Europe. Nubia, modern Sudan and Ethiopia had been loyal to the Patriarch of Alexandria from the beginning of the church. Nubia followed the Coptic church and adopted Myophysitism. The Nubian kingdoms of Nabatia, Mercuria and Elodia reached the peak of their power in the 10th century before eventually being overrun by the Abbasid Caliphate. 
By the beginning of the 11th century, the Byzantine Empire had recovered much of its former territory and reasserted itself as the dominant power in the eastern Mediterranean. Antioch, Syria and Palestine, north of Jerusalem, were recaptured by the empire before the turn of the millennium. Under Emperor Basil II, the Byzantine Empire conquered Bulgaria, the Crimea and the southern Caucasus. In the year 1001, Stephen I became the first Catholic king of Hungary, and in 1008, Olaf Skutkuning, king of Sweden, was baptised as a Catholic. 1,000 years after the birth of Jesus Christ, all of Europe was united in the Catholic faith. The kingdoms of Nubia had spread Christianity into sub-Saharan Africa, and the Church of the East had brought Christianity as far east as China. The Byzantine Empire had... Yeah, because people were forced... They were forced to believe a certain way. They were not given the freedom to believe. The Byzantine Empire had been restored to its former glory, and Rome and Constantinople had gone over 100 years without a schism. They were not given the freedom to dissent uh, on some of the false teachings. Excommunicated, uh, they were murdered. But tensions in southern Italy and a new threat from Central Asia would soon lead to an enduring schism in the heart of Christendom. In the early 11th century, Lombards in southern Italy rebelled against the Byzantine Empire and recruited mercenaries from the Duchy of Normandy in northern France. The Normans were granted land in return for their service and quickly became the dominant power in southern Italy. The Norman use of Latin Rite worship with unleavened bread created conflict with local Byzantine citizens who used leavened bread which they viewed as symbolic of the resurrection. Pope Leo IX came to view the Normans as a threat and raised an army to assist the Byzantine war against the Normans, but he was defeated by the Normans at the Battle of Civitate in 1053. In 1051, Benedictine monk Peter Damian urged the Pope to correct widespread problems in the clergy, particularly the lack of celibacy, the purchase of clerical offices, a practice that was named simony after Simon Magus, who sought to buy the gift of laying on hands from the Apostle Peter, and the appointment of bishops by secular rulers, which was known as lay investiture. The attempt by the popes in the coming decades to correct these vices would lead to Simon. In 1051, Benedictine monk Peter Damian urged the Pope to correct widespread problems in the clergy, particularly the lack of celibacy, the purchase of clerical offices, a practice that was named simony after Simon Magus, who sought to buy the gift of laying on hands from the Apostle Peter, and the appointment of bishops by secular rulers, which was known as lay investiture. The attempt by the popes in the coming decades to correct these vices would lead to confrontation with the Holy Roman Emperor. Peter Damian also began the fundamental debate of the second millennium concerning the relationship between reason and faith, arguing that philosophy should be used in a manner consistent with the Christian faith. Patriarch Michael Cerularius in Constantinople was angered by the Norman disturbance in southern Italy and wrote a letter criticising their liturgical practices. He also closed Latin Rite churches in Constantinople in reprisal for Norman closings of Byzantine churches in southern Italy. Pope Leo IX sent Cardinal Humbert of Silva Candida to negotiate with Cerularius, but Cerularius refused to meet with him. After months of waiting, Cardinal Humbert delivered a notice of excommunication against Cerularius on July 16th, 1054, but Pope Leo had died three months earlier, so the excommunication had no effect. Nevertheless, Cerularius removed Leo's name from the diptychs in Constantinople. In 1066, William the Conqueror defeated Harold II of England at the Battle of Hastings. William became King of England. In southern Italy, Pope Nicholas II made peace with the Normans, investing Norman leader Robert Guiscard as Duke of Southern Italy and Sicily. The Normans finished their conquest of Byzantine Southern Italy and Sicily in 1072 and turned their sights on the Balkans, where Norman leader Robert Guiscard defeated the Byzantine Empire in a series of battles and established a short-lived Norman foothold. However, the Normans were urgently recalled to Italy by Pope Gregory, who was under siege by Emperor Henry IV of the Holy Roman Empire. By 1073, 
the Holy Roman Empire had fallen from its heights under Otto I and was facing fragmentation and decentralisation as various principalities challenged the authority of Emperor Henry IV. Meanwhile, Pope Gregory VII was attempting to reform the church by restoring priestly celibacy, ending simony and ending lay investiture, the appointment of bishops by the secular king. This last reform brought Pope Gregory into conflict with Emperor Henry, and after the Emperor attempted to depose Gregory, Gregory deposed and excommunicated the Emperor. After several attempts at reconciliation, Emperor Henry IV invaded Rome, and appointed Guibert of Ravenna as anti-pope Clement III. Robert Guiscard defeated Emperor Henry IV at Rome, but following the victory Robert Guiscard's Norman soldiers plundered the city. After three days the people of Rome rose up against the Normans, but the Normans suppressed them and set fire to much of the city. Pope Gregory VII was exiled and died shortly thereafter. Robert Guiscard's army left Rome to focus on their war with the Byzantine Empire, leaving anti-pope Clement III who was loyal. Oh, an anti-pope. So they excommunicated the, the, the pope that was there, killed him, or exiled him, and then set their own anti-pope. ...to the Holy Roman Empire in control of the city. The next two popes, Victor III and Urban II, were forced to reign from outside the city until 1096 when a French army called to the Crusades by Pope Urban II liberated Rome and allowed Pope Urban to safely return. The foremost theologian of the 11th century was Bishop Anselm of Canterbury, who introduced the ontological proof for the existence of God, argued in favour of the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son, and taught the satisfaction theory of the Atonement, that Jesus Christ offered himself on the cross not merely as a ransom to the devil, but in satisfaction of the debt of honour that mankind owed to God. Anselm became embroiled in what would become the fundamental philosophical debate of the second millennium, concerning the relationship between universals and particulars. The Latin world had generally accepted the realist philosophy of Plato and Aristotle, that universals have a real existence. Late in the 11th century, a French philosopher named Roscelin challenged realism and introduced the philosophy known as nominalism, teaching that only particulars exist and that universals are merely words given to common attributes of particulars. Rosalind also argued that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit were not one God, but three gods. Anselm, a realist, strongly condemned Rosalind's teachings, but the cause of nominalism would be taken up in the 12th century by the philosopher Peter Abelard. The Seljuk Turks, led by Arp Aslan, had migrated from Central Asia north of the Caspian and Aral Seas into Persia, and invaded the Byzantine Empire in 1068. In 1071, the Turks decisively defeated the Byzantine Empire at the Battle of Manzikert, effectively bringing all of Anatolia under Turkish control. The Turkish Empire became the dominant power in the Middle East, stretching from Anatolia to the borders of China. Zahir al daula Artuk Bey founded the Artuquid dynasty, which ruled the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea, including Antioch and Jerusalem. Reports soon reached Europe of mistreatment of Christian pilgrims in the Holy Land. In 1095, Byzantine Emperor Alexios I appealed to Pope Urban II for help against the Seljuk Turks. Pope Urban II proclaimed the First Crusade and granted a plenary indulgence to all who joined. Indulgence to those who join. Yeah, you won't find that in scripture. You won't find that. The indulgence. Old indulgences given. False teaching. A peasant army led by Peter the Hermit arrived in Constantinople in 1096, but they were easily defeated by the Turks upon crossing into Anatolia. The Prince's Crusade succeeded in defeating the Turks in Anatolia. In 1098, they captured Antioch. Meanwhile, Fatimid Arabs had succeeded in liberating Jerusalem from the Artiquid Seljuks. The Fatimids were allied with the Byzantine Empire. Nevertheless, the Crusaders set aside the initial objective of repulsing the Seljuk Turks and sought to reclaim the Holy Land for Christendom. In 1099, the Crusaders captured Jerusalem from the Fatimids after a long siege. The Crusaders slaughtered every inhabitant of the city. Slaughtered every inhabitant of the city. 
In contrast, when the Arab Muslims had captured Jerusalem in 637, they did not kill a single inhabitant. Well, so they slaughtered everybody and then uh, those that claimed to be th that weren't Christian didn't slaughter anybody. Instead, the Muslim Caliph, Umar, son of Al-Khattab, calmly entered the city unescorted and toured it with Patriarch Sophronius. The Crusaders defeated a counterattack by the Fatimids at the Battle of Ascalon, and the Fatimids retreated into Egypt, leaving the Crusaders in control of the Crusader states at Antioch, Tripoli, and Jerusalem for the time being. At the start of the 12th century, Pope Pascal II appointed Eric Knupsen, Bishop of Greenland and Vinland, modern-day Newfoundland, making him the first Bishop of America. The investiture controversy that began under Pope Gregory VII and Emperor Henry IV finally came to a resolution between Emperor Henry V and Pope Callistus II with the Concordat of Worms in 1122. Previous Holy Roman Emperors had thought it their right to appoint bishops and to confirm the papal election. The Concordat of Worms significantly reduced the Emperor's power. The King was recognised as having the right to invest bishops with secular authority, but not with religious authority. The Melkite Patriarch of Antioch, Anastasius II, with the con controversy that began under Pope Gregory VII and Emperor Henry IV, finally came to a resolution between Emperor Henry V and Pope Callistus II, with the Concordat of Worms in 1122. Previous Holy Roman Emperors had thought it their right to appoint bishops and to confirm the papal election. The Concordat of Worms significantly reduced the Emperor's power. The king was recognised as having the right to invest bishops with secular authority, but not with religious authority. The Melkite Patriarch of Antioch and religious authority was recognised as having the right to invest bishops with secular authority, but not with religious authority. Not in Antioch. The Melkite Patriarch of Antioch, Anastasius II, died in 609, and Constantinople began to appoint a series of titular patriarchs, who resided not in Antioch, but in Constantinople. In 685, the Maronites elected Bishop John Maron of Betrun as Patriarch of Antioch and all the East. The Maronites welcomed the Crusaders and sought reunion with Rome. In 1131, reunion was granted, and Maronite Patriarch Gregorius Al-Halati was recognised by Pope Innocent II as the rightful Patriarch of Antioch. Early in the 12th century, a professor at the University of Paris named Peter Abelard planted the seeds of rationalism that would come to dominate philosophical thought in the second millennium. Abelard championed the use of Aristotelian logic regardless of whether it led to orthodox theological conclusions. Abelard was accused of denying the separate existence of the three persons of the Trinity and of teaching that Jesus did not atone for humanity's sins but merely set a good example for his disciples to follow. Abelard's innovative ideas brought him into conflict with the Catholic hierarchy and St. Bernard of Clairvaux. By the beginning of the 12th century, discipline in monasteries had once again declined. The Cistercian movement sought to restore monasteries to the austerity of the rule of St. Benedict, with an emphasis on manual labour. St. Bernard of Clairvaux joined a Cistercian monastery in the 12th century, and quickly became recognised across Europe as the most influential mystic in the church. Bernard rebutted the teachings of Peter Abelard and was instrumental in preaching the Second Crusade. In 1144, the Seljuk Empire recaptured Edessa from the Crusader states. In response, Pope Eugene III called for the Second Crusade, which was fervently preached by St. Bernard. However, the Crusaders suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of the Seljuks. St. Bernard felt humiliated and wrote a letter of apology to the Pope. Elsewhere, the Holy Roman Empire launched the Wendish Crusades to convert the Palabian Slavs in northeast Europe and Aragon and Castile retook Spain from the Muslim Taifa kingdoms. The papacy suffered a series of defeats against Norman-occupied southern Italy following the Norman sack of Rome in 1084. Pope Innocent II was ambushed and taken prisoner by Norman troops in 1139. In 1144, papal forces were again defeated by the Normans. The newly formed Roman Senate used the opportunity to revolt against the Pope, declaring the Commune of Rome in 1144. The following year, Pope Lucius II died, leading an assault against the Commune. 
Arnold of Brescia was a student of Peter Abelard. While Abelard abandoned his teachings under the threat of excommunication, Arnold brazenly championed Abelard's teachings in defiance of the church. In 1145, Arnold returned from exile to join the Commune of Rome, and the following year he succeeded in driving Pope Eugene III from the city. Arnold rejected the temporal power of the Pope, denounced clerical wealth and championed apostolic poverty, ideas that would find a growing audience among dissenters such as Peter Waldo, the spiritualist sect of the Franciscans and John Wycliffe in the coming centuries. Pope Adrian IV summoned an army from the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa to retake the city of Rome and Arnold was burned at the stake. <laughs> Burned at the stake for what? For uh... to read in temporal power. Arnold brazenly championed Abelard's teachings in defiance of the church, leading an assault against the commune. Arnold of Brescia was a student of Peter Abelard. While Abelard abandoned his teachings under the threat of excommunication, Arnold brazenly championed Abelard's teachings in defiance of the church. In 1145. Arnold returned from exile to join the Commune of Rome, and the following year he succeeded in driving Pope Eugene III from the city. Arnold rejected the temporal power of the Pope, denounced clerical wealth and championed apostolic poverty, ideas that would find a growing audience among... Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. What, you know, that's what the apostles and Jesus taught. ...and dissenters, such as Peter Waldo the spiritualist sect of the Franciscans and John Wycliffe in the coming centuries. Pope Adrian IV summoned an army from the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa to retake the city of Rome, and Arnold was burned at the stake. Mm, burn at the stake for preaching truth. Islamic philosophy flourished as early as the 8th century, based on the writings of Plato and Aristotle, and led to significant developments in science and mathematics. In the 11th century, Persian scholar Al-Ghazali led a reaction against Greek philosophy in his treatise, The Incoherence of the Philosophers. Al-Ghazali was strongly rebutted in the 12th century by the Spanish philosopher Averroes, whose arguments in favour of the use of Aristotelian logic had a powerful influence on medieval scholastic theologians at the universities of Paris and Naples. In the middle of the 12th century, Peter Lombard, a scholar at the University of Paris, wrote one of the first comprehensive textbooks on Christian theology, the Book of Sentences, which would form the basis of scholastic studies for the next several centuries. <laughs> Saladin, a Sunni Muslim from the Abbasid Caliphate, travelled to Cairo as an advisor to the Shia Fatimid Caliphate. Saladin quickly rose through the ranks and eventually overthrew the Fatimid Caliphate, becoming Sultan of the new Ayyubid Sultanate and launching a successful military campaign that recaptured Jerusalem, Damascus and other territory from the Crusader states, following which he negotiated a peace with King Richard the Lionheart of England. During this time, Constantinople had made trade agreements with Venice, Genoa and Pisa. Italian merchants soon became a sizable portion of the city's population, causing resentment among the local Greeks. Tensions in Constantinople finally boiled over in 1182 when the Greeks massacred nearly the entire 60,000 Italian population of Constantinople. In 1194, Holy Roman Emperor Henry VI took control of the Norman Kingdom Southern Italy and Sicily through his marriage to Constance, daughter of the Norman King Roger II. Henry's son Frederick would go on to lead a series of wars against the city-states of Italy that would eventually lead the Pope to turn to a new ally, France. Venice got its revenge against Constantinople in 1204, when the Fourth Crusade, which had been commissioned to come to the aid of the Crusader states, instead sacked Constantinople and replaced the Byzantine Empire with the Latin Empire. The Byzantine Empire split into three different kingdoms on the opposite shores around Nicaea. In 1209... Now I'm going to stop right there. The St. Francis of Assisi... Okay, continue this later. <laughs>